1 Kings chapter 19, one verse of scripture, verse number four. The prophet Elijah said to the Lord, I have had enough, Lord. Let's say amen to the reading of God's word. Today we're in part three of our Going Dark series. Uh, today from the topic, no mas, no mas. Father, we thank you. We give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. We thank you for this holy hush as we're anticipating you speaking to us. We thank you, God, for we know that your word will come forth with power, clarity, and anointing. I'm prepared, and God, I'm dependent upon you. I ask you to speak. I ask you, God, to word my mouth. I ask you allow the, the, as the, as the flower fades and the grass will allow your word to stand the test of time as we as we're listening we're leaning in in jesus name amen come on you can take your seats in the presence of the almighty god that's right and anticipating god speaking to you come on put those hands together and give him some praise some glory and some honor amen for the last several weeks we've been in this series talking about going dark and as we've been discussing this going dark it is really a spiritual space it's a spiritual space that I believe that God is desiring for all of us to avoid, uh, to avoid, to allow the circumstances of our life and the things that you and I experience to push us into darkness. Uh, the things that we experience and the things that we go through uh, should not push us into darkness, but rather it should push us into the presence of the almighty God. The Urban Dictionary defines going dark is to remove oneself from all social media outlets um, and otherwise make oneself unavailable for contacting uh, typically done in order to be more productive I do believe that there's a way that we can go dark and we don't stay in darkness I believe that there should be a time that all of us ought to detach ourselves to get to a place the way we can be more productive especially in light of social media because and oftentimes many of us are a slave to our phone the first thing we do when we wake up in the morning is we check our phone we see what's happening on Facebook we see what's happening on Instagram we see what was happening here and there and all the different social sites even in church when we come to the house of God when we come to worship instead of us paying attention to the word of God we we're down on our phone acting like we're taking notes and and doing all that cleaning out our emails and all those things that we could have did the other six days we wait that we come in the house of Lord and we begin to do these things but can I tell you that whenever it is we get to a place whenever it is the enemy is trying to push us into darkness I believe we ought to take that as an opportunity to allow God to allow his presence to engulf our hearts and our minds we've talked about in part one learning how to fall back all of us have to learn how to fall back the proper way what we do in the natural is when we experience some things, we say, well, I'm just going to remove myself from the situation. I'm just going to fall back. I just won't deal with them no more. I won't talk to them no more. I'm going to fall back. But no, really, what we should do, we ought to fall back and be dependent upon God. We ought to fall back and say, you know what, God, I'm tired of trying to manipulate my life and control my life. I'm going to trust in you with all my heart. I'm not going to lean to my own understanding, but I'm going to acknowledge you in all my ways that I know that you're going to direct my path last week we discussed how we ought to when there's some season in our life that we have no frame of reference no frame of reference which means that simply I have not been here before I've never experienced this before I don't have any ideas I don't have a point of reference I don't have how I'm supposed to handle this situation because I've never been in this situation before just like God pushed Elijah out of out of Jerusalem and sent him down to the that brook and sent him to that widow's house in Zarephath it was the place that Elijah had never been there before and when I'm somewhere that I've never been before I need to depend on God like never before whenever it is I'm in a place and I don't have any frame of reference I don't have a set of ideas I don't have a notion I don't have experience I don't have anything to do with where I'm at I need to learn how to depend upon God because God is trying to reveal something to me can I pause for a moment and encourage 
encourage you and remind you if you're dealing with something right now that you've never dealt with before God is trying to show you something that you've never seen before God is trying to reveal himself to you in a way that you that he's never revealed himself to you so when I don't have a point or reference I need to look for a fresh word yes I do I need to look for a fresh word Elijah was down at that brook and as he was down at that brook he was waiting and he was anticipating God to tell him the same God that told him to go to the brook he refused to move until God told him to leave I know the brook has dried up I know the ravens have stopped bringing me the food and the nourishment but I'm gonna wait on a fresh word from the Lord I don't know who I'm talking to already but I just believe that there's somebody in a dry situation and you're trying to leave like yesterday you're trying to get out of it as soon as you went in but God tell, told me to tell you that you better not move until you get a word from the Lord and here whenever it is that I'm posturing myself properly I have a right I have a, I have a right an obligation to look to the Lord for him to give me a fresh word God came to Elijah down in that brook and he said I need you to arise get up from where you are I need you to go down to Zarephath God sent this man of God down to Zarephath at the time read it when you get a chance or go back and listen to the messages you know you can listen it's all on YouTube all on Facebook all on our website you can go back and catch up with us and hear that place that, 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 that Elijah went to was the, was the heart it was the, the, the really the, the, the very the very the home of all of this pagan worship that was going on in their day and time it was the heartbeat pay, 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 Big pagan worship. I'm trying to say Baal and pagan. So I made up a word and say pagan. Bacon. What a bacon. Like bacon. A bacon. But pagan and Baal. Come on. Here. This pagan worship was to the place to where this was the order of the day. And instead of God sending Elijah seemingly into safety, God sent the man of God right into a place of refining. Yes, he did. He sent this man of God into a place to where God was trying to burn something out of him and get something thing out of him that's what Zarephath means remember Zarephath means a place of refining and God will allow you and I to be in a place because he's trying to get some stuff out of us he's trying to burn out that doubt and burn out that fear and burn out that attitude and burn out that disposition he's trying to burn some things out of our character so he can be able to use us properly so whenever it is that I don't have no frame of reference I need to look for a fresh word but not only that I need to look for a fresh start yes sir look for a fresh start you would think that as God sent the man of God down to Zarephath you think everything would be all kosher you would think everything the ducks would be in a row but no God sent him to a widow's house here God said I'm going to send you somewhere that where you are in need you need somebody to help you you need someone to assist you but I'm going to send you to someone that needs their help they need help themselves you're going to send me to a widow you're going to send me to somebody who was poor themselves you're going to send me to a person or to a place that where she's in need herself God oftentimes give us a fresh start and our fresh start that he's given us is not everything the way that we desire when we talk about a fresh start we think all our relationships about to be tight we think our money about to be tight we think our health gonna be the way that we desire to be but no God sometimes gives us a fresh start and he's just simply pressing the reset on our struggle God sent Elijah from one struggle to another struggle and I know you've been faithful at the brook I know you was faithful in your season of meagerness you was faithful at your time the way you thought now as soon as God come my way I'm gonna walk into my wealthy place nope it doesn't work that way boo boo God will take you from struggle to struggle he'll take you from trial to trial he'll take you from situation to situation and he said I'm sending you to give you a fresh start because it's something more somebody say it's something more it's something more that God God broke Elijah down at the brook I believe he broke his flesh down they say you're not going to eat and do what you want to do at the brook and now God is breaking his pride down at Zarephath they say I'm going to humble you and let you know that I'm the one that's going to depend and I'm the one that's going to feed you and I'm the one that's going to help you God is breaking this man of God down and as Elijah runs across this woman the Bible says he told her he see right in the middle of her busyness right in the middle of her collecting sticks to be able to feed her and her son the final meal that they're going to eat they're going to eat it and die oh the word of the Lord came to her Lord have mercy I'm trying to tell you that God will stop you right in the middle of your business and stop you 
right in the middle of you planning your funeral stop you right in the middle of you saying that things won't ever get better my marriage won't ever be healthy my children won't ever do right and God to stop you right in the middle of your busyness and say I got a word I got I got a word for you and can I tell you I believe that God has set you and I up today because he wants you to pause for the call because he got a word for you what what is it that God wants to say to us I told you last week this is why I got happy that where we ought to look with a fresh uh, we ought to look with a pair of fresh eyes yes sir we ought to look with a pair of fresh eyes what you mean bro pastor I'm telling you that God God interrupted this woman as she was getting ready to go and feed her son you got to read it when we get a chance first king 17 she was collecting sticks to go and feed her son and she told the man of god as a man of god said go and get me some water she she obliged then he said go and fix me something she said all i have is a little meal in a barrel all i have is a little bit of oil and here we talked about the fact that god god doesn't care about what i think i'm limited in i need to look at what i have with a pair of fresh eyes lord have mercy i know that may be all you have oh but that's all you need come on here when when we're talking about the lord we got to stop looking at our situations as if we are in the deficit we got to stop looking at our situations as if god has done us a disservice you've given all of this to him you're giving all of this to her and all I have and can I tell you all I have is all I need even in my meagerness even in my pain even in situations that I don't want to be in I need to be able to look at my situ situation with a fresh set of eyes if you look at your husband with a fresh set of eyes you'll say oh boy not all that bad at all if you look at your wife oh with a different fresh set of eyes you'll say oh girl she kind of cute come on here oh can I tell you if you look at your situation oh with a different set of eyes the Lord he'll speak something to you look what the man of God said because here as God is helping us when we don't have any frame of reference look what we ought to do we ought to look for fresh instructions I look for fresh instruction yes sir I, I know what you're doing ma'am I know what you're doing you're preparing yourself you're gonna fix your last meal you and your son gonna eat and here you, you and your son gonna eat and you're gonna die but God gave you give is giving you some new instructions God is saying that before before you do this I need you to take care of the Lord I need you to take care of the work of God I need you to take care of the man of God she said all I have and the man of God said don't fear don't fear your lack don't think like you're going to run out don't think God's going to leave you out here on front street without anything but God said you take what you have and give to him first you take what you have and you give to him first I'm talking to somebody right now right as we're standing on the doorstep of our holiday season right when you're going to go out here and buy Christmas for everybody you're going to try to you're going to buy all these appliances that nobody's ever going to use you're going to buy these socks that nobody's ever going to put on come on here you're going to buy this candy that's nasty don't give me no fruit cake come on here somebody you may be no, I can't say that here. Can I tell you? Don't, 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 don't get, don't get, don't, don't get any, don't get. You know, we go out here, and we spend all of our money and do all of these things. And what am I saying to you? I'm telling you that God is instructing all of us that if you want to come out of your lack, if you want to come out of your meekness, you need to give to the Lord first. Yes, sir. You need to make sure that you honor the Lord with what it is that you have. This is a principle that this man of God is trying to give this woman, and we miss this. We think somebody trying to pimp us. We think somebody trying to get in our pocket but what God is trying to do God is trying to get us out of a place of lack and enter into a place of abundance and the way that you come out of your place of lack you got to enter in with faith and with some giving and God is saying I'm trying to take you out of your lack and your giving and you can enter into the abundance and the only way you can do it you got to trust God with your little oh little becomes much with the righteous you don't take care of everything else and then you start taking care of the Lord no you you put your heart you put your heart in the things of God and where your heart is there's also will be your treasure oh we talked about this last week it's called the principle of sowing and reaping my friend you got to sow you sow you sow come on here you sow you you ought to, you ought to sow where you want to go you ought to sow where you go you ought to feed what's feeding you come on here if you get encouragement if you get the word of God if you're better if you're a better man a better woman your children are better your marriage is better you ought to sow and you ought to give 
captive as unto the law. It's called the law of reciprocity. Oh, if God is feeding me, I can't help God. God don't need my money. Oh, but because God is feeding me, I'm a feed and I'm going to sow into the thing that God is using where his hand, where his hand is on. Lord, have mercy. I'm trying to tell you that God is saying, I need you to get in on this. Somebody else say, get in on this. You ought to get in on it. You ought to get in on it. If, you, if you're trying to go to another place, you, it's going to cost you something. If you're trying to go to another dimension, it's going to cost you something. If you're trying to allow God to snatch you out of where you are, it's going to take your participation. Oh, how are we going to participate, bro? Pastor, I'm so glad you asked. Look at the Bible. First Kings 17, 14 says, it says, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. Look at it. The jar of flour shall not be spent. And the jug of oil shall not be empty. Lord have mercy, church people don't know when to get happy. I'm trying, I'm trying to tell you, when I, when I give to God, he said that the oil, I know all you had was a little bit of oil. He said that the oil will not run out. Oh, and your oil will not be empty until the day the Lord sends something else. Lord have mercy. Oh, that's a word for somebody, but don't, don't you clap if you don't give. Don't you clap if you don't tithe. Don't you clap if you don't give nothing to the Lord, because it don't belong to you. <laughs> Look, look what God is trying to say to us. God desires for us to not only look with a fresh set of eyes and not, not, only, not only get to the place where we're looking for a fresh word, but we ought to look for a fresh frame. Here we go. Watch me now. We ought to look for a fresh frame. I have no frame of reference. So when I don't have a frame of reference, I am to look for a fresh frame. That's what I was, what I was trying to tell you. Whenever it is that God breaks down my frame, Whenever it is that God breaks down my security, whenever it is that God breaks down my season of comfort and things I know how they're supposed to go, I am to look to God to give me something fresh. He's trying to build me a fresh frame. Look at look at First Kings seventeen fifteen says, and she went and did. Lord have mercy. That's the difference right there. She she went and did as Elijah said, and she and and her and she and he and her household ate for many days. This woman got a fresh frame because of her fresh obedience here she got God showed her something new and something fresh because of her obedience and can I tell you in our day and time we got more word we got more access to more word we got more access to on our devices we got all these books we got all these bibles we got all this stuff but here is one thing for you to put the information down on your tablet it's one thing for you to read it but it's another thing for you to let it get down in your heart the way whenever it is that you hear something or whenever it is you learn something you got to put it into practice just hearing it is not going to benefit you just being in the room in the atmosphere is not going to benefit just having the tv on on in, in, in your house as you walking around and you doing everything else you in the shower and you and you cooking and you whooping the kids and all that just having it in the atmosphere it makes a difference but it's not the big point what am i trying to say oh i need to take whatever it is that's being 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 declared i need to take whatever is being ministered and i need to put it down down in my heart and I got to walk this thing out yes I got to walk I got to walk out the word this woman obeyed the man of God oh let me talk about obedience for a moment because this one of the church dirty words is right next to subjection it's right next to authority oh this word obedience Lord it's like a cuss word because we don't want to obey I don't obey nobody I'm a grown man I'm a grown woman I, I don't do what nobody tell me to do oh can I tell you that's why that's why that's why we haven't got moved from the place of lack and to a place of overflow because we won't obey. Let me, let me, talk, let me talk to you about obedience. Let me talk about obedience. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Let, let, come on. Come on. Ooh, it's okay. Take a deep breath. It's okay. Sorry. Right. Let, let me talk about obe obedience. Look at this. Obedience is to hear God's word and to act accordingly. That's what obedience is. We don't got to make it deep. We don't got to make it anything so vast and so, so difficult to understand. Obedience is to hear God's word and to act accordingly. This woman heard what the man of God said and she acted accordingly to obey, to hear. Listen to what it says. To hear or listen in a state of submission. If I had time, I'd take you to the book of James where James, James, James admonishes us. This is how we ought to receive the word. We ought to receive the engrafted word in a place of submission, in a place of humbleness, a place of brokenness. I can't tell you the amount of people that come in moments like this and they have a posture of, I already know that. Have a posture, oh, he not talking about me. Have a posture saying, oh, me and God are good. I worshiped all day. I prayed all day. I've been saved all day and I'm glad. And we come into a place, a place of training, 
place of equipping, a place of empowering, talking about what we already know. If you have a heart and a mind talking about what you already know, then can I tell you that you're going to stay where you are? Come on, the learner always surpassed the learn. It's the person that's hungry. It's the person that's thirsty. That's always going to run slap past the person that thinks they got everything under control. I'm trying to help you. And here we'll listen to messages like this and hear this say, oh, I'm not, I'm not trying. I don't, I don't need that. I don't, you don't know my story. You don't know my situation. But anytime I hear the word of God, I'm going to submit myself and say, God, there's something about my life that you're trying to edit. It's something about my heart that you're trying to push me to a place, God, that I've never, I've never been before. Listen, that word obedience, put it back up for me. That word obedience literally means to hear under. To hear under. How, what's your posture when you approach God? Are you, are, you, are you listening to this message right now? Only just to, to put a, 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 a kind of look, a little tick on your schedule to say, I went to church today. Are you listening to this message today? Only to hear, are you only listening, look, good God, are you only listening to this message right now to hear things you agree with? Are you only, are you listening to this message only to hear things that affirm something you already know? If I come to a place that only affirm what I know, I'm not going to grow. Here, I need to stretch you. Come on, welcome to the rack room. I'm trying to stretch you here. I'm trying to, I'm trying to do like grandma said. I'm trying to learn you something. I'm trying to teach you something. Come on. I, I, I'm not sure supposed to just be listening and looking for what, I, what, what affirms me and to scratch me where I itch. The Bible talks about those itching ears. Oh, it talks about the prophet Isaiah. The people told Isaiah, prophesy unto us smooth things. They told Isaiah, tell us what we want to hear. Oh, I ought to get to the place where every, at least once a Month. You ought to walk out of here mad. You ought to be walking out and say, mad. Say that little short joker, he better not be standing there, though. You ought to walk out here mad. Come on, at least once a month, you ought to walk out of here saying, who told him? Who told you that? Who told you about my every now and then? They be telling me, Pastor, you stepped on my toes. I'm so sorry. I was trying to go for the whole foot. Come on here. Every now and then, I'm going to step on the whole foot. Every now and then, you ought to hear something that make you say, ouch. And hear something that make you say, ooh. And hear something that make you say, hey, man. Come on. Every now and then. <laughs> hey. Because listen, just because I don't apply it does not mean that I'm not responsible for what I heard. Postpone, postpone, postponed obedience is still disobedience. You don't get around to obeying God. Where all my New Year saints at? I'm waiting on the new year. Uh, in, in January, I'm going to get January, in January, I'm going to get myself together. As soon as I land this job, I'm going to let them stop paying my bills. You caught that, huh? You caught that? All right. As soon as my wife started acting right, I'm going to let her go. Postpone, <laughs> that's what it gets. Postpone obedience is <laughs> still disobedience. And let me drop something else on you. Since we already here, we here, it's okay. Look, I'm just talking to people on Twitter. That's all, all the heathens on Twitter. That's all. Look, they ain't talking no now. That's the heathens on Twitter. Look, partial obedience is disobedience. Let me hit you with that. Come on, right before, right before the holidays. Come on here. Uh, partial obedience is, is disobedience. God tells you to forgive somebody. You start back speaking to him. That's partial obedience. I'm talking to him. I said good morning, didn't I? Partial obedience is disobedience. God said to bring your type to the house of the Lord and you want to throw $20. Partial obedience is still disobedience, Lord have mercy. Oh, here, but here, whenever it is, listen, let me tell you, you want to know, and this is what we talked about a few weeks ago, we talked about creating margin in our lives. We need to create margin. Some of us are so close to the world and all of its tactics that where no, no wonder God can't move. No wonder you'll come to a place like this and you'll say, I ain't feel nothing. I didn't get nothing. It was boring. I'm ready to go. What time to game? Because, because here, maybe I'm too close to the world, but whenever it is, I create Ache some margin in my life by beginning to oh, separate myself from the world and begin to obey God. Look what James said when I create margin in my life. James 4 8 said, Draw near to God and He'll draw near to you. Come on, Grandma said it like this You take one step, then the Lord will take. 
Help me here. Okay. When you draw not and see, no wonder you don't hear God because all you do is listen to foolishness all day. No wonder you don't hear God when all you're doing is listening to what this person say and what that person say. And you're sliding up here and sliding down there. No wonder you don't feel God. But when I obey him, when I draw not to him, he said he'll come close to me. Oh, when I create margin in my life, I need to create some space where God can dwell. Create some space where God can move. Create some space where God can be a blessing in my life this woman this woman created some space oh Isaiah I don't got time to go to it but Isaiah said Isaiah 119 says if you're willing and obedient oh you'll eat the good of the land when I'm willing and obedient God will take care of me when I'm willing and obedient God he said there's no plague that'll come not your dwelling when you're willing and obedient look at first Kings 17 16 I got to hurry y'all the Bible says the jar of flour was not spent neither did the jug of oil become empty listen to this according According to the word of the Lord spoke by he spoke by Elijah oh they never ran out because of her obedience see can I tell you that God sent Elijah to this widow not for the widow but God sent Elijah to the widow for her God had already shown us she that he can take care of Elijah without the widow he fed him with ravens he fed him with the with the with the drink he drank water at the brook but he sent oh my God he sent the woman to the he sent Elijah to the woman out so she can get in on the blessing what am I trying to tell you I'm trying to tell you that God will send you to a place called truth and love not just for, for we can come up but no God will send you so you can get in on what God is doing and God will say because of your obedience you're going to eat the good you're going to eat the good of life. let me roll let me go let me go let me go I'm doing good I'm doing good I'm doing good I got somewhere I got to go look, look at first Kings 17 7. you would you would think that after all of that you would think that everything it's just going to continue to, to fall in place. Look at, verse, look at, look at 1 Kings 17, 17. After this, somebody say after this. After this. The son of the, of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. And his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. Wow. Can, can I say it plainly? His brother died. Yeah. This, this woman who was minding her own business. Oh, let me say this, because when she met Elijah several years earlier, two, three years earlier, her, her declaration was, I'm going to prepare this meal and me and my son are going to die. Yeah. Yeah. Her words just came back to see her. <laughs> right, let me go, let me go. I, I, that's not even my message, but I'm, I want to just remind you, you got to be careful, be careful about what you say out your mouth. Be careful about, I'm always going to be, be careful about what ain't going to never happen. Be careful about, be careful what you say, life and death. Your, your world is framed by your words. Be careful, be careful what you say. But this woman allowed the man of God to come to her home. This woman took care, fed the man of God, did what God told. I just told you for 10 minutes about the blessing in obedience. And you would think because she obeyed that her obedience would safeguard her from trouble. And so oftentimes we feel like because I obeyed God, because I gave, because I did this, we think that's supposed to insulate us and nothing else is supposed to go wrong in my life. God, if I gave and God, if I served you, God, if I read your word and studied your word, if I did what I was supposed to do, God, how come you let this happen? How come I still got fired? How come my loved ones still died? How come my marriage still tore up? How come all this stuff happened? I did what you told me to do, my friend. What, what God, I did what you told me to do. What, what is it that God is desiring to do? God is desiring. I told you to give your fresh frame yes he is look at first Kings 17 18 the bible says and y'all don't mind the bible right i'm just teaching the bible that's all i'm doing don't mind the way i'm getting loud i'm just trying to teach the Bible. And, and she said to elijah what have you against me oh man of god you have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause my, the death of my son now this is she, she 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 shows me something very clear she shows me the human nature because we can step out and obey God. And the moment something happens to us that we don't want to happen, we begin, we begin to project our anger. Now she gets angry at Elijah, who in turn, she's really not angry at Elijah. She is angry at God. 
And in turn, she begins to reflect on her sin and the things that she's done. And she's saying, well, God, how come? How come? How come you let this happen? Why couldn't you just leave me alone? And now all of a sudden, she mistakenly feels as if because of what she's going through is a result of her sin. Because of what she's going through is a result of her past. She believes that she's catching what she's going through right now because of the mistakes that she made and because of the wrong turns that she made days gone by. Oh, but can I tell you, my friend, we got to be able to get to the place so whenever I'm going through a season, when God is trying to build me a fresh frame, I got to remember what the word of the Lord say. I got, I got to, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Oh, this woman, she, she's portraying out what we call false guilt. That's false guilt. What, what is false guilt? Somebody say false guilt. False guilt. False guilt. She's feeling guilty about what has happened to her son. She's feeling guilty about what has happened by her situation. She's feeling guilty because she's going through something. Let me help you with some false guilt. It's built on or based on self-condemning feelings that have you that, that you have not lived up to your own expectations or those of someone else. Someone has put expectations on your life. And because you have not lived up to those expectations, now you're walking around feeling guilty. Or you put, you put expectations on yourself. That's why it's very dangerous. very dangerous to let stuff get in your heart. You ought to plan. You ought to have a vision for your life. But you can't hold yourself hostage to your goals and your visions and your dreams. You can't hold yourself hostage because this thing hasn't happened. I shouldn't be still being broke. I still shouldn't be living with my mama. I still shouldn't be renting no apartment. I still shouldn't be single I still shouldn't be doing it and now because you haven't lived up to your own expectations you're walking around in guilt y'all just keep looking straight it's fine I know I ain't talking about nobody here just everybody I teach them the heathens on Twitter here can I tell you can't, false, false guilt arises when you blame yourself even though you've committed no wrong or when you continue to blame yourself after you've confessed and turned from your sin I'm trying to help somebody because we, we haven't done anything wrong. Just because something hit your house, because someone that you love died. You cannot walk around in guilt and walk around saying you woulda, coulda, shoulda. Just because your marriage did not work, you ought to own up to your part. No marriage dissolves. No, no, they're going to take two to tango. No marriage dissolves just off one partner for the most part. I know there's extreme differences, but I'm not talking about those extreme cases. I'm talking about the day-to-day -day cases that we hear about. But here, you can't stand around for the rest of your life sitting up and blaming yourself because this didn't happen and that didn't happen. Or if you confess your sin and you own up to what you've done, God is not hanging that stuff over your head and reminding you and throwing that stuff in your face every day. Somebody say false guilt. This woman said, my son is dead because of me. False, false guilt keeps you in bondage to three destructive weapons. Shame, fear, and anger. You, you don't walk around with a t-shirt with a on saying, I'm guilty. But because you are flowing and walking in shame because of what you did. Because, because of fear. Because you're afraid of losing what you have again. And because of being angry and being upset because this happened and that happened. That's what false guilt. It keeps us bound. It keeps us in a place that where we're not able to produce. It keeps us in a place where we stay in the dark. Oh boy. Can I tell you who's behind it all? Revelation 12, 10 says, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation, the power of the kingdom of God and the authority oh, of his Christ has come. Look at this. For the accuser of, of our brethren. The accuser of our brothers has been thrown down. I'm just trying to remind you the accuser of the brother. That's what the enemy does. Even in moments of worship, he'll tell you not to lift your hands because you're a hypocrite. He'll tell you not to give because you're a hypocrite. He'll tell you not to come to church and not gather with the people of God because he knows what you did last summer. And the devil want to remind you of your past and remind you even of your present. Oh, but whenever the enemy reminds you of your past and reminds you of your present, you need to remind him of his future and say, devil, you're going to hell. Oh, you're going to be to a place where it's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. My God, I'm trying to tell you that the enemy has all of us in a place that where we got to get over kill. The Lord does not condemn us. The Lord lets us feel conviction, but he does not condemn us. I don't know who I'm talking to right now, but stop blaming yourself over your past. Stop blaming yourself over your kids. Stop blaming yourself over things that are beyond your control. If you could have changed it, you would. If you had it in your power, you would have did better. If you knew better, you would have did better. You did the best you you could with what you had. Somebody don't tell the Lord thank you. 
I see this. I see this so often with. I see this so often with our, with our adult children. Our adult children begin to, when, when, because things didn't go what they wanted to go. And here we have, we have these, these, these parents that, that some, some of them was absent. Some, some, some was abusive. And some, some wasn't there and all that. And I get all of that. But, but, but sometimes I hear of all these horror stories of, of adult children. Now because we've come of age, now we're blaming our pathetic lives on our parents. And we'll say, because my mama didn't do this and my daddy didn't do that. And here, when they fed you every day, when they took care of you, when they looked out for you. And come on, that's not trying to give nobody a get out of jail free card. But your mama and your daddy did the best they could with what they had. And come on, parents, don't let any one of your children, don't you let any one of your grandchildren hold you in bondage about what you did not do. And you were never there for me. I was at work, you booger. I was taking care of you, but I, that's why I wasn't always there. Amen. Want me to be... At your game. Who bought your uniform? <laughs> Let me go. That wasn't for that, that, I guess that wasn't relevant. That wasn't, that wasn't relevant. That wasn't relevant. I got a word for somebody. <laughs> I got a word for somebody. I'm, look, look, I'm trying God trying to give me God trying to give me a, a fresh frame. And here even individuals who have been who we, we we've done some things we won't we won't testify about. We've been involved in some things. We've done some things. All of us, all the scripture says, all have sinned. And you may have wasted what you think is the best time of your life. You wasted your years partying and smoking and doing all these things. And here you cannot hold yourself hostage. My Bible tells me if any man be in Christ, oh, he's a new creature. All oh, things are passed away. Behold, all things new. What is God trying to do? Whenever it is, I have no frame of reference. I'm finishing up my mess from last week and I'm trying to bring you up to this week. We ought to look for a fresh wind. Oh my God, when you don't have a fresh, when you don't have a fresh vision, when you don't know what's going on, when you're in body, look for a fresh wind. What, what do you mean a fresh wind? Because this, this, this son had died. This son had died. Lord have mercy, he was dead. And look what happens in 1 first, first Kings 17, 19. The Bible says, and, and, and he said to her, look what he says, give me, give me your son. Lord, can I tell you whatever it is in your life, this is what God is decreeing to you today. Give it to me. That's what God is saying. Give me your son give me that daughter give me that husband give me that wife come on give me that pain in your body give me your career give me those dreams give me those vision the Lord said give it to me God said I can do much more with it than you can by yourself oh you ought to give it to him give it to him give it to him Elijah said give me he said give me give me your son the Bible says and he took him off from her and carried and carried him up to the upper chamber where he was lodged and laid him on his own bed verse 20 says and he cried to the Lord oh Lord my God have you brought calamity even upon the widow and whom I sojourned by killing her son oh he doesn't even know what's going on he don't even understand verse 21 said then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord oh Lord my God let the child's life come unto him again oh my God Elijah is looking for a fresh wind what's so powerful about this because nowhere before this time we don't have any record we don't have any account of any Anybody being raised from the dead. Elijah is praying for something that he's never seen happen before. <laughs> boy, you preaching this Bible. This boy is praying for something that he's never seen before. And whenever it is, I get to a place where I'm waiting on God and I'm looking for a fresh wind. You may never did it for my parents. You never did it for generations before me. But Lord, I'm looking for a f I got to go. The Bible says. <laughs> <laughs> the Bible says he's praying for God to raise this brother to resuscitate this brother he's never seen it before this reminds me this, this encourages me to let me know it doesn't matter how bad my situation is <laughs> I may not have a frame of reference for it. I may not see it done before. It's never happened to you. It's never happened for that. It's never happened over there. Oh, but my God is able to do exceeding. I got to go. I got to go. I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm doing good. This, the story says God, God breathed on this brother and the wind came back in him. <laughs> That's what that's what God is God God is trying to give us God is trying to give us a fresh wind. That, that wasn't my message, y'all. I'm just that's just that just that's just that's just my Hoover doors. That's a Hoover doors. That's Hoover doors. Hoover doors. That's Hoover doors. Hoover doors. Hoover doors. That's just simply hors d'oeuvres. But it's but it, when you look at it when you look at it, it says Hoover doors. 
Stay with me, Robert. Stay with me, Robert. Don't be laughing at me, man. Don't be laughing at me. Hoover door. Give me some Hoover door. Look. <laughs> That's chapter 17. In chapter 18, we don't have time for it. There's a showdown at Mount, Mount, Mount Carmel. <laughs> There's a showdown. Here, Elijah, one man, squares off with 450 false prophets. And here he shows down with these false prophets. He tells them, all right, the God that answers us is going to be the God that we're going to worship. If Baal be God, he's going to answer. They took, they took this sacrifice and they put in all the prophets of Baal. Got they calling and they praying and they doing all that. And here the Bible, I love the Bible. I hate how I don't have time to deal with it. Because the scripture says, and, and there was no answer. And there was no word. You know why? Because there was no God. And anytime, oh, I don't got time, don't do that. Anytime, anytime you're exerting your energy and your effort and your time and your treasure in something other than God, there's going to be no benefits. There's not going to be no residual. There's not going to be no return. There's not going to be no return. The Bible says Elijah started picking at him. He said, maybe your God is going on lunch break. Elijah literally says, maybe your God is in the restroom. Maybe he's hard of hearing. Maybe he cannot hear you. He can't hear what you're saying. And Elijah tells the people, pour water on the sacrifice and drench the wood. And here, God Almighty, Elijah prays. And the Bible says God sent down fire. And the fire consumed the sacrifice. And the fire consumed the wood. And the fire of the Lord. Lord, I don't got time. No, I don't. Don't do that to me. Don't do that to me. Don't do that. <laughs> the, the, fi the fire consumed the sacrifice. Here, Elijah is used mightily by God. God has used this brother like never before. Here, this one man ends up killing these 450 false prophets. Read me, get a chance. First Kings 18. I'm not making it up. He kills these false prophets because they're the ones that have pushed the people into famine. Here, the Bible says that that takes place. And then as we kind of jaywalk into chapter 19, I see something very critical. I see pressure from potential loss. You'll see, I see some pressure here because whenever it is, whenever it is that you and I get to a place where we don't know what's happening in our lives, the pressure begins to mount up. I see pressure from potential loss. Look what happens in 1 Kings 19.1. The Bible says Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. The Bible says, and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Here, here Ahab goes back to Jesse, his wife. And tells Jesse everything that happened. I don't got time. That's a whole marriage seminar right there. But I don't got time. I got I to gotta, I I move. I got I to gotta move. He goes back and tells his wife. You would think that after God shows up in a powerful and a miraculous way. You would think that this would cause Ahab, Jezebel, and everyone to repent. But look what happens in verse 2. Y'all, y'all, am I doing okay? Am I doing good? Am I boring y'all? Y'all good? Look at 1 Kings 19, 2. Thank you. Thank you very much. 1 Kings 19, 2 says, Then Jesse sent a messenger to Elijah. Look, look what she says. So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of the one of them, or one of them, by this time tomorrow. Pl plainly, that's what I'm saying. Come on, sideline preach. That's what she said. Jesse said, I'm going to kill you. Uh, Je Je Jesse said, I swear to my gods that I'm going to kill you just like you killed one of those other prophets. That, that, there's something in this because I, I see Elijah, Elijah, because of what it is that is transpiring, this woman sends this message and Elijah response is what surprises me. Verse 3, I'm going to come back. Verse 3 says, then he was afraid being Elijah. And he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. Look, this is amazing to me. Because in chapter 18, we really get a chance, chapter 18, this brother just squared off with 450 prophets. And one woman. One woman got this brother so scared. He don't know what to do. He don't know what to do. So I, just, I just looked at somebody and it's like, yeah, what's wrong with that? That's right. One woman. That's right. The power of one woman. I just, I just felt, I felt they're like, yeah, and what? We, I, I know that's how, that sound about right. That sound about right. Oh, look, we can be all tough. We can square all. We can say everybody else and be like, come on, what you want to do, bro? What you want to do, bro? And then that one say, say, Harry, sit down. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> the power. 
Uh, one woman. <laughs> That's not my message. I got to go. I ain't playing with y'all. Well, look here. Let me tell you. Look. Look at how, look at how foolish this is. Listen, listen how foolish this is. The, the fact that, not only the fact this brother squared off against almost five, I'm going to preach numbers, almost 500 people. <laughs> but here, she swears by her gods that just lost the battle. <laughs> Come on, sideline preacher that never showed up. Her gods never showed up. Look at the fallacy in this. And listen, come on, y'all. I'm not, I, don't, I don't ever try to act like I was tough. I don't ever try to act like I was no goon, no, no gangster. I don't ever try to act like that. Yeah, come on, real goons and gangsters and smell that a mile away. Come on here. Yeah. But my, my, point, my point is, I, I learned this. I learned this growing up. When somebody was ready to fight, they would fight about it. Come on, they, they ready to fight. It, it was those one. It was, it was when those times when we were on each other's shoulder. Come on. When you see brothers doing this, talking about, talking about, come on, cross this line and see what I do. That was some scary jokers. Nobody want to fight. Come on here. If you spinning around and doing all them jokers don't want to fight. Come on, Je Jezebel going to send a messenger. Why Jezebel didn't send an assassin? Why Jezebel didn't send a killer? Oh, she just was trying to control. That's what the spirit of Jezebel do. They bark and they growl and they try to intimidate you and force you to do something. And they never do anything because she knows she don't have any power. Oh, what am I trying to tell you? This brother's afraid of what the devil is doing and saying. And the devil can't do anything. I got to go. Let me go. This brother, I got to go. I got to go. This, that's, some, that's some pressure. This brother, this brother falls under pressure. I'm trying. Here, listen. This brother is, it's a pressure from, listen to me, potential loss. I want to talk to somebody who, who's so scared over what potentially may happen. I want to talk to the person that can't sleep at night because you worry about what may happen. You you worried about what will come on. You have you you just got pregnant. You talking about what would happen? They ate the social security not gonna be around for them to get you. Come on, you care. You just got the baby. They talking about what social security not gonna be here by the time your baby get up. Y'all ain't gonna talk to me up here. We know how the father. We've been making up all these stories and all this stuff about that. Oh Lord, have mercy. Can I tell you that today is the yesterday that you were? Is the tomorrow that you worried about yesterday? And can I? tell you it didn't happen what am I telling you we spent all our time worrying about tomorrow and here we're standing in our tomorrow today and those things that 99% of the things that we worry about never happen this brother retreats God uses him mightily and here he retreats and runs off a threat I'm trying to talk to somebody right now that you've seen God's hand move you've seen God use you in a mighty way you pray and God answer you trusted God and God delivers you and now just because you're in the season of squeeze and you feel as if God's gonna let you down oh no my friend this brother this brother uh, Elijah Elijah did something so critical because every time we've been as we've been studying Elijah every time Elijah moved he moved because God told him God told him to go show himself to Ahab and he did it God told him to go to the brook and he did it God told him to go to the widow's house and he did it and here anytime you move whenever it is you're not working off the God walk, walking and working off God's word can I tell you gonna get yourself in a place and an emotional condition that you cannot handle oh i just said something so good right there let me back that thing up and after i back it up i'm gonna stop and i'm gonna say what what i'm like can i tell you that god is i can't do it last time i did that i ripped my britches come on i tried to drop it like it was out and i had to, had to walk out and I, and I ripped my little britches can i tell you here god desires for us elijah obeyed god's word to go show himself to ahab he obeyed god's word to go down to the brook he obeyed god's word to go to jezebel go, go down to zero fat and now all of a sudden because he's afraid because he's scared because of something is beyond the control he moves before God tells him to move Lord have mercy I'm trying to talk to you because there's some of us that's so afraid about tomorrow you're so afraid about the doctor's appointment you're so afraid about what may happen and God is telling you to stay still and see the salvation of the Lord somebody say preach preach pastor Cobra Read, read, read James when you get a chance. I don't got time for it. Elijah just shows us that he's a man like us. And let me, let me remind you of something because the best of men are but men at their best. Doesn't matter how wonderful a person is, they're still a man. That's why you shouldn't put anybody up on a pedestal 
That's why you shouldn't allow anybody to put you on the pedestal. You ought to stay on your knees because when you fall, you don't got father fall if you're already on your knees. But when you hoist it up on people's shoulders and people putting you up on the pedestal, no, my friend, you should not allow anybody to think more, to think more of you than you really are. We're just men. I don't care how holy we're men. I don't care how anointed you're just a human. I don't care how God used you. We're still just a human being. We're just a human being. This brother moved. This brother moved off of intimidation. And some of us are getting out of our wealthy place because we're intimidated. You better not let anybody push you out of purpose. That's because of the threats and because of what they've said, because of this person. If somebody has, if somebody comes in the room and they affect your, 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 your spirit, you've given that person too much power. If, if you go to work tomorrow morning and your day is based off of whether what, what, what's the face show up? And you see, what's the face? And what's his name? And he's your, now I'm saying, oh, it's going to be a bad day. Oh, it's a bad day. There goes they go, they go the neighborhood. Oh, you've given that person way too much power, way too much control. I will not allow anybody to intimidate me out of being in the place that God has sent me to. I will not let anybody from their threats, from their words, because they're intimidated. I don't care what you do. Oh, God, God, God is with me. Let me go, 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 let me go. This brother, this brother goes, let me see, I got to skip all that. This brother gets to the place, but the pressure from potential loss. Let me hurry. Let me hurry. Let me see the next, the next thing. I see pressure. Come on, it's a lot of peas, so stay with me. Pressure from a pattern of pessimistic thoughts. Uh -huh. mm. Pr pressure from pattern. I don't know what y'all doing that sound, but I can hear it. It's moving and shaking. I don't know what's happening there. Y'all doing something to me here. Pr pressure, I'm just trying to mind my own business, but they bother me. I ain't doing nothing to them. They mess with me. Look, pr pressure. Thank you. Pressure from a pattern. A pessimistic thought. Look, look at verse 4. Look at it. First Kings 19, 4 says, here we go. There we go. Thank you. Look, it says, then he went on alone into the wilderness. In a real sense, Elijah went dark. <laughs> Anytime I move, when God doesn't instruct me to move, you can look for darkness and the wilderness. This brother has been traveling all day. Now, now, now he's now he's spent. He's traveling. He's in a place doing something that God didn't tell him to do. He sat down. Look at watch the purposeful language. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed. Listen to his thoughts. He prayed that he might die. Look what he says. I have had enough, Lord. He said, look what he says to God. Take my life. For I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Look at this roller coaster this man of God is on. Yeah. Chapter 18, he stands up boldly, flat-footed, and confronts 450 prophets. Yeah. And because of the potential threat of somebody, yeah. now he's suicidal. Yeah. And he asked God to kill him. This brother prayed, listen to his thoughts. He said, he, he goes out by himself. He's just, he's pessimistic at best. What's pessimistic? It's a lack of hope or confidence in the future. Oh, Lord, have mercy. And whenever it is that you're in the wilderness, and whenever it is you're in a dark place, and whenever it is that you're in a place where you, find, you feel that you're by yourself and you're all alone, your confidence in the future, your confidence in God bringing you out, your confidence in God answering you is waning. And this brother is all in his mind. It's all in his head. And Elijah, just that fast, we didn't even turn the pages in our Bible. Elijah slipped into depression. Just that fast. What, what, what's depression? You know what depression is. We're so inundated with this in our day and time. Just a little simple definition. A deep sense of despondency, discouragement, and sadness. Often linked with a sense of personal, listen to this, powerlessness. And a loss of meaning in an, listen, in, in, in an enthusiasm for life. Look, look, I, I don't know. I, I, think, I think I just read somebody in the mail. I, I, I may not be right at your doorstep, but I'm in your subdivision. I'm on your street. Come on, I, I just read somebody in the mail right here. Because it just describes some of us that we're despondent, that we're just disoriented. We don't know what to do, where to go. We're discouraged and we're sad. And oftentimes it's linked, be, it's, it's linked to situations that's beyond our control. And we say if we could change it, we'll change it. If we can do it, we can do it. And Elijah gets to the place where he literally tells God, no mas. He, he tells his brother, no mas. He's, he's, he's a prophet. He's a man of God. 
And he says, no more. I, I don't know if you will remember or not. It was in 1980 <laughs> that we kind of kind of borrowing our, our, our topic today. It was 1980 to where we got Sugar Ray Leonard. We have this brother Roberto Duran. They're in their, they're in their rematch in here in 1980. And here they're, they're, they're there and they're fighting. And Sugar Ray start doing the, he start not, not what they call, they call it the, 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 the when he wind up and hit him with the, the rope. But not, that's not the rope, though, but something else. Called, what's it called? The, the who? He said the polo punch. Bolo. I don't, that ain't what I'm looking for either. But anyway, but anyway, the bolo, he said the bolo. He hit him with the polo, the polo, bolo punch. He, 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 he sucker jabbed him. Whatever it is. Come on, I can't think of the term right now. But anyway, 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 he, he wind up and hit him, hit him with the left. And the point is, this is, this brother, Roberto, is a heavy, he's a, he's a champion of the world. And because Sugar Ray beat the brakes off of him, he turns to the, to the referee and says, no mouth. He says, no more. I don't want to fight anymore. Oh, Lord have mercy. I, I, I don't know who I'm talking to today, but you're tired of life beating you. You're tired of being in a fight. You're tired of the financial struggle. You're tired of raising these kids by yourself. You're tired of your marriage being the way it is. And now you just got to the place where you're saying, no more, no more, no more, no more. I get tired of the sucker punches from the devil. I'm getting tired of people talking about me. And you get to the place where you say, no more. And if you're not careful, my friend, because you get to a place of no miles because you get to a place of saying no more because you were ready to throw in the towel can I tell you that God desires to speak to you oh God desires to speak to you before you quit God want to say something to you before you walk away God want to say something to you before you get to the place the way you give in what God gave you let me go let me go y'all y'all know this brother says no my his last two prayers was God send fire God send rain, and the third prayer, God kill me. Did you hear what I said? His last three prayers, God send the rain, he did it. God send the fight, he did it. And he's saying, God kill me. Can I tell you, Elijah, that's exactly what he's trying to do. He's not trying to kill you physically. <laughs> oh my, you better be the man. <laughs> I, I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. I got, to, I, got, I got more stuff than I can give you. I got more stuff than I can give you. Let me go. Somebody say no miles, no miles, no miles, no miles. No more. What, what determines you to get to this place? What, 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 what do you say about yourself? Let me ask you a question. Can I give you a business for a second? We only got a couple more minutes. Don't give me a business. What, what do you say about yourself? Are you always saying, I can't do nothing right? I'm tired of this. Well, why should I even try? I'm useless. I hate myself. Look at this person. Look at that person. I wish I was more like them. I wish my life was more. What do you say about yourself? When you, when you continue to promote the lies of the devil, you're continuing to expose yourself and setting yourself up to quit. I am not to decree and declare what the enemy says about me. No, but I am to stand on God's word. What do you say not just about yourself? What do you say about your situation? I don't see a way out. It doesn't matter anyway. Oh, I can't tolerate it. It's not fair. I can't help it. It's never going to change. I can't bear What are you saying about your situation? What do you say about your future? So what? It doesn't matter. I'm too old. I'm too young. The color of my skin. I made too many mistakes. No one likes me anyway. Nobody ever married me. I'll never come out of debt. I'll never own my own home. I'll never have my dream car. What are you saying about your future? That pushes all of us into a place where we, we have nowhere to go. And here I'm just trying to help you. I'm trying to help you with your discouragement. Trying to help you with your depression. Trying to give you help for the holidays. Because it's what you say and what you think and how you feel that dictates where you are. Look what Jesus said in Luke 21, 34. Jesus said, but take heed to yourself and be on guard. Lest your hearts be overwhelmed and what? And depressed and weighted down. Lord have mercy. That's what depressed literally means. It means to be weighted down. As I was putting this together I read something that said it was so powerful they said that the press is, 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 is almost as a pick as, as a pillow you can take a pillow and if you put something very heavy on the pillow and leave it there overnight the pillow will eventually return back to its own its original form but if you take that same pillow and take that same heavy object and leave it there for weeks and leave it there for months and leave it there for years when you remove the heavy object the pillow will never return to its form 
because it's been depressed so long and can I tell you my friend that you're not designed to be depressed God didn't create you to be depressed but you got all this heaviness in your heart and heaviness in your mind and heaviness in your spirit that God is saying move that weight out of the way let me go huh? 2 Corinthians 1 8 look at Paul says he says for we we do not want we don't want you to be unaware brothers of our affliction we experience in Asia for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself listen to what Paul said Paul said this burden was so heavy we was contemplating trying to go to heaven Paul said, this burden is so heavy, I didn't even know what to do. I don't know how to change. I don't have anything to do. Paul said in verse 9, Luke said, indeed, we felt that we have received a sentence of death. Anybody want to be honest and say, you've been going through so long, going through so bad, you feel like you got a curse on your life? You feel like that? If it's not one thing, it's another. If it's not another, it's the same thing all over again. And, and, and here Paul says, like we, like we got a death sentence. Look what the psalmist said in Psalm 38 8. I'm just trying to help y'all. I know y'all ready to go, but I'm trying to help you. Look at Psalm 38 8. It says, I'm exhausted and completely crushed. My groans come from an anguished heart. You and I can get so overwhelmed because of depression, because of things that we're going through, and because of the pressure of life. It can push us to a place that we want to quit and push us to a place that where it seems as if there's no hope, there's no relief, there's no future, there's no help. Oh, but can I tell you, my friend, before you say no mas, before you say no more, I know you got pressure from potential loss. I know you got pressure from a pattern of pessimistic thought. I know you, you, you got a pressure, oh, my friend, from the enemy of our soul. But let me tell you my last thing and I'm out of here. Oh, you ought to have some pressure because pressure will push me into purpose. Yes, sir. Lord, have mercy. Oh, that God would take that same pressure that's trying to depress me and God would take that same pressure to push me into purpose. Oh, look at 1 King 19, 5. It says Elijah, he laid down and he slept under the broom tree. Oh, he was under the boardwalk. No, he wasn't. He was under the broom tree and the Bible says, and behold, an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. Right there in his mess right there in his depression right there in his spirit is feeling a bad for himself the Lord sent an angel to touch him verse 6 says and he looked and behold there was there was at his head a cake baked and this is an angel and there was a cake that was baked by the angel is it safe to say this is angel food cake is that, is that, is that, anyway ain't got nothing to do with nothing here I'm out of time can I tell you here this brother woke up <clears throat> Verse 9, the angel says, y'all ain't listening. That's why you ain't one funny. Y'all like, I'm ready to go. Look, verse, verse, verse 7 says, I'm trying to help you. And then you don't call me for an appointment next week. And nobody gave an appointment with me next week. Uh, and talk to me about depression, despondency, uh, feeling, feeling pressure, and all that. No, no, listen to the message is what I'm going to say. I'm going to send you the link. That's what I'm going to do. Verse 7 says, and the angel said to the Lord, come again a second time. And he touched him. Let me tell you. I'm just going to tell you what I'm trying to tell you. It's, it's not Jezebel's fault. Elijah's not out here because of Jezebel. Elijah's not even reacting the way that he's reacting because of Jezebel. Elijah is reacting the way that he's reacting, I believe, because of four things. Because he's hungry. He's thirsty. He's angry. And he's lonely. I believe these four things have pushed this brother out of character and caused him to get to the place the way he's forgotten about what God has said and done in his life. And there's somebody right now, let me help you with your depression. Oh, your depression is to the place and you're pushed in the darkness. Oh, because mate, where's your hunger for the things of God? Where's your longing? Where you're thirsting for the things of God? Are you angry with God? Are you angry with your spouse? Are you angry with your circumstances? Do you feel lonely if you allow your emotions to control you and you do not get a handle on your emotion or oh, you'll get to the place that where you're going to quit that way you're going to give up you're going to give in to depression and suicidal thoughts oh lamentation 318 says so I say my endurance will has perished so my hope from the so has my hope from the Lord have you been experiencing something so difficult the way you feel like your endurance is gone you can't put another step in front of the other you can't put on another phony smile you can't go nowhere you don't want to go no more because of your trouble Verse 19 say, look at it, look at what the man of God Jeremiah said. Remember my affliction and my wandering, the wormwood and the gall. Verse 30, he said, I will never forget 
this awful time as I grieve over my loss. Who am I talking to in here to where you, you said, I'll never forget where I'm at because of what I'm going through. I'll never forget because of this pain. It's pushed me to a place where I want to quit. But Jeremiah helps me. Come on, I'm talking to somebody. I know you've lost loved ones. I know you lost jobs. I know people have walked away from you. I know people have, direct, uh, have betrayed you and let you down. Oh, but before you quit, can I remind you of something? Lamentation 3.20. Let's roll, y'all. Lamentation 3.21 says, but this I call to mind. Therefore have I hope. Lord, have mercy. Oh, he says in verse 22, he said, it is the Lord's mercy that we have not been consumed because his compassion fail not. Jeremiah feeling depressed. Jeremiah said I'll never forget this awful season I'll never forget 2020 I'll never forget 2019 I'll never forget 1980 I'll never forget 1922 I'll never forget but then when I remember what God said when I remember God's mercy I'm saying I'm going to be alright come on put your hands together give God some praise up in here I got this plane on the runway. I'm getting ready to get up out of here, y'all. I'm trying to help you to come out of your situation. I'm trying to help you to come up out of your depression, to try to come up out of your defeat, to come up out of your spirit of overwhelm. The Lord got a word for you. The Lord said, Lord, the Lord got a word for us. And I'm saying, Lord, I need you to speak to me. I need you to give me a word. Anybody want some help? Anybody want to come out of what? you in let me tell you the first thing you need to do you need to remember what God has already done let me help you with your depression you need to remember what the Lord has already done he's healed you before he's delivered you before he's touched your relationship before he snatched you out of depression before he's helped your marriage before I need to remember what the Lord has already done then I need to remember what the Lord has already said I know what the devil is saying but what has God said I know what my enemy is saying but what has God said you said in your word that no weapon formed against me shall ever be able to prosper I know what my spouse said but what is he saying you said in your word you said that the Lord is my light and salvation whom shall I fear the Lord he just stripped in my life. I'm looking for somebody that's want to lean on what the Lord has said. I'm leaning on the everlasting arm. I'm leaning. I'm leaning on the word. I'm sorry, y'all. But will you say with me, I'm coming out. Will you say with me, say, I'm, I'm coming out. And when I come out, I'm coming out on the word. Yes, I is. I said, I'm coming out on the word. You can stay back if you want to. You can stay defeated if you want to. You can stay depressed if you want to. You can cry yourself to sleep every night. But I cried my last tears yesterday because I heard... I heard David say, weeping may endure for a night, but joy is coming in the morning. I'm coming out on the word. My body is ravishing with pain, but I'm, I'm coming out. I'm coming out on the word. That back is stripes. I'm healed. Y'all ain't gonna help me preach in here. You gotta remember what God has done. You gotta remember what he said. And remember, yeah, remember what he showed you I can't I can't die here because the Lord he showed me something I see a brighter day I see I see the Lord pulling me up out I see I can see the Lord I see his hand I can see that the Lord is coming my way I can see my joy I can see my peace. I can see my healing. I can see the breaking of day. My breakthrough is up the road. I can't die. I can't quit. I can't say no matter. Let me say, Lord, no matter what I'm going.
going through. I'm going to praise you in advance. I don't got to wait till the battle is over. I can shout. I can run. I can jump. I can leap. Because he's showing me something. Somebody say, yeah. I said no miles. You thought I was about to quit. I got a towel in my hand. I was gonna throw it in. But I'm gonna take my towel and I'm gonna wave it and say Jehovah Nisi. When I don't got no shrimp, he'll fight my battle. When I don't see my way, I'll dance, I'll praise, I'll give him some glory. Say yeah. Get up, Elijah. The Lord got to work for you. Get up, Elijah. Don't stay down there. Get up, Elijah. I know you're defeated. Get up, Elijah. I got a word for you. Get up, Elijah. Somebody say, go. I don't want to let it go. I got to stop. I wish I had some desperate people in the house that say I was just about to quit. I was just been to turn in my divorce papers. I was just about to mail it in. But the devil is a liar. I got a word and I can't stop now. I give him glory. Come on, y'all to praise him. On behalf of everyone at Truth and Love Ministries, we want to thank you for joining us for our virtual worship experience. We want to thank you for your likes and your shares, your comments and your emojis. But we also want to invite you to partner with us as we continue to be the hands and the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. You do know that he told us that we ought to feed the hungry, we ought to clothe the naked, and we ought to be the church. And you can help us to continue to do just that through your generosity. And there are three easy, safe, and secure ways that you can do just that. You can text the word T-I-L-JAX, one word, T-I-L-JAX, to the number 77977. You can go to our website, www.truthandlove.tv, or you can go to the Apple Store or the Google Play Store, search for Truth and Love Jax, download our app, and you can give that way. We thank you for your participation. We thank you for your generosity, and we love you, and we'll see you next time. Here comes the church. God bless you.